thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us give thanks to the gracious and merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has protected, assisted, preserved, and accepted us, had compassion upon us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask in the Almighty God to keep us his peace, his blessed day, and all the days of our life. O Master, Lord God, the Pantocrator, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything, for you have covered us, helped us, guided us, and accepted us to yourself, spared us, supported us, and have brought us to this hour. Therefore, we ask and entreat your goodness, a lover of mankind, to grant us to complete this holy day and all the days of our life in all peace with your fear. All envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of wicked men, and the rising up of the enemies hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this your holy place. Let those things which are good and profitable do provide for us, for it is you have given us the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and upon all the power of the enemy. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through the grace, compassion, and love of mankind of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you, with him and the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, who is of one essence with you, now and at all times, and unto the age of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercy, and according to the multitude of your compassions, blot out my iniquity. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity, and my sin is at all times before me. Against you only I have sinned and done evil before you, that you might be just in your sayings, and might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth, you have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with your hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear gladness and joy. The humbled bones shall rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face, and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I shall teach the transgressors your ways, and the ungodly men shall turn to you. Deliver me from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. For if you desired sacrifice, I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your good pleasure design, and let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, offering and burnt sacrifices. Then they shall offer calves upon your altar, and then all. Luxor, Simon, a reading from the Holy Gospel according. Arise, O you children of the light, to praise the Lord of hosts, that he may grant us the salvation of our souls. When we stand in the flesh before you, take away from our mind when to sleep of forgetfulness. Grant us sobriety, O Lord, in order that we may learn, understand that before you at the time of prayer, and send up to you the appropriate doxology and win the forgiveness of our many sins. Glory to you, O lover of mankind. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. In the nights lift up your hands, O you saints, and bless the Lord. The Lord shall bless you out of Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Glory to you, O Let my supplication come near before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my petition come before you. Revive me according to your word. Let my lips flow with praise when you have taught me your ordinances. Let my tongue speak of your words, for all your commandments are righteous. Let your hand be for saving me, for I have desired your commandments. I have longed for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my meditation. My soul shall live and praise you, and your judgment shall help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commandments. Alleluia. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and unto the age of all ages. Amen. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, from now and unto the age of all ages. Amen. Glory be to you, O the Good One, and Lover of mankind. Hail to your Mother, the Virgin, and to all your saints. Glory be to you, O Holy Trinity, have mercy upon us. Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered, and let all who hate his holy name flee from before his face. But let your people be in blessings, thousands of thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousands, doing your will. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Amen. Amen. So the first watch of the blessed midnight hour. We offer to Christ our King and our God, beseeching him to forgive us our many sins from the Psalms of our teacher David, the prophet and king. May his blessings be with us all. Together. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am poor and weak. Preserve my soul, for I am pure. Save your servant, O my God, who hopes in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for to you I will cry the whole day. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I have lifted up my soul. For you, O Lord, are righteous and gentle, and plenteous is your mercy to all who call upon you. Give ear to my prayer, O Lord, and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble I cried to you, for you heard me. There is none like you, O Lord, among the gods, and there is none that is able to do your works. All nations whom you have made shall come and shall worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wonders. You alone are the great God. Alleluia. Holy, 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 a reading from the Holy Gospel. According to our teacher, St. Matthew the Evangelist, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamp and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, arise and go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Glory be to God forevermore. Amen. Tenoshto moko veristos, mikiotan agathos, neminemai thoab, jiaki exotia monainan. Behold, the bridegroom is coming at midnight. Blessed is the servant whom he finds watching, but he whom he finds sleeping is unworthy of going with him. Therefore take heed, O my soul, that you may not fall into deep sleep. Then be cast out of the kingdom, but watch and cry out, saying, Holy, holy, holy are you, O God, for the sake of the Theotokos, have mercy on us. O my soul, be mindful of that awesome day and wake up and light your lamp with the oil of joy. For you do not know when the voice will call upon you, saying, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. So take heed, my soul, not to fall asleep, lest you stand outside knocking like the five foolish virgins. But watch, entreating that you may meet Christ the Lord with rich oil. And he, may he grant you the wedding of his true and heavenly glory. You are the rampart of our salvation, O Theotokos, the virgin, the mighty and impenetrable fortress. Abolish the counsel of the adversaries. Transform the sorrow of your servants into joy. Fortify our city, defend our governors, and intercede the, for the peace of the world. 
For you are our hope, O Seotokos. Keni en kea ike so seona stone ononami. O Heavenly King, we come for the Spirit of Truth, who is present in all places and fills all, the treasurer of good things and the giver of life. Graciously come and dwell in us and purify us from all defilement. O good one, and save our souls. Just as you were with your disciples, O Saviour, and give, gave them peace, graciously come also and be with us, and grant us your peace, and save us and deliver our souls. And as we stand in your holy sanctuary, we consider standing in heaven. If you also course you are the gate of heaven, open for us the gate of mercy. Es of St. Mary of your mother, St. Mina the Miraculous, and the blessings of the fast you fasted for our salvation, and the blessings of Emma Daniel and the fathers that are gathered. Make us, Lord, worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father.
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to St. Mary's in St. Mina's. Um, we're very blessed today to have His Grace Bishop Basil, Basil join us. Um, we'll be starting off with some hymns and the rest of the program um, will be an interview and some Q&A questions to follow. Uh, but we'll walk you through that a bit slowly. So we'll just start off with hymns first. Thanks. Just like the bird when it found its home, just like the happy dove, your house, Lord, I love your house, I love with honesty, your house is again everyone we're gonna begin the interview with his grace bishop basil now um i'd like to introduce robert asmi and irini zachary to come to the front and conduct that thanks
Thanks, Ayedna, and good evening to everyone who's made it um, tonight to attend the um, interview and Q&A with His Grace Bishop Basil. He's um, the Bishop of the Southern United States. Am I right, Sayedna, in saying that? In the Southern United States. In the... I'd just like to make a differentiation. Sayedna and Yusuf, may God keep him till the second coming. He's the Bishop of the Southern United States. I'm a Bishop in the Diocese of the Southern United States. I serve under him. Okay, so thank you for the clarification. I'm sure we're being live streamed as well, so I have to make sure that I get everything right tonight. Um, okay, so Sayedna, so without further ado, we'll get right into it. Um, so the first question we have for you today is, what was your life like in your youth, and how did you feel the call to the monastic life? Um, uh, first, I'm just very thankful to be with you all. Um, it's a beautiful church with wonderful fathers from the, the, the little that I've seen uh, since I've been in Sydney and the much that I've seen since I've been in Sydney. Um, may God continue to bless the youth services and all the service of the diocese. Um, and um, I, like many of you sitting here, was just going to youth meetings regularly. And um, I grew up in a church um, with a blessed father, Abu Nabshoi Dimitri, who established the church in, in New Jersey and wonderful spiritual fathers um, that came after him that I was discipled under. Um, and I was just the average youth in the church. I didn't know about monastic life um, except for from a friend. And um, he was very vocal about his desire to go to the monastery. And I wasn't very vocal about it. Um, and I would take retreats at the monastery in Texas. And that was uh, my first exposure to retreat under the auspices of Sayyid Nabi Yusuf. And may God keep him, like I said. Um, and that was my interaction with monastic life, uh, besides reading from the books. And so my heart, um, I believe that for every youth, um, as we grow up, we have to make decisions as to what we're going to do in our professional life, what we're going to major in, how we will spend the rest of our lives, marriage, um, other lifelong decisions. And um, I began to see the, the futility of life, that all of this, irrespective of what one does, they, uh, they need to offer themselves to God because if I'm, whatever professional job I choose, whatever major I choose in the university, um, I will uh, be serving God through that job. And um, if God wills that you would get married, then you would be married and your, your service to your wife or to your husband is a service to God. And your service in the church certainly is a service to God. So in the end, we are serving God. So once we realize this, it's like our life is a... Um, uh, being written on a check, the amount of the check is our life, and we want to know where we're going to write it to. And we keep on asking God, teach me and guide me where you want me to write my life to. So I felt the peace of the monastery uh, when I went and retreated there, and the fatherhood of Sayyidina Abu Yusuf was very important to, to know um, that I would be discipled under him. Yeah. So that's what caused me to go to the monastery in Winnipeg. After a long retreat and praying and uh, that God's will would be revealed to me. Yeah. Um, second question, Sayedna, can you tell us a little about your life experience and your ministry as Bishop of Southern USA? By God's grace, uh, as I mentioned, I serve in the Diocese of the Southern United States uh, with Sayedna B. Yusuf, or under Sayedna B. Yusuf and uh, with Emma Gregory. So the diocese is split into three sections, um, which Sayedna B. Yusuf serves all of it, but I have the blessing of serving the state of Florida. Um, there is uh, 23 churches in Florida and another 10 communities. Um, communities for us means they don't have their own parish priest and they pray on Fridays and Saturdays. So um, one of the parish priests prays with them. So my service is that I, like Sayyidina Nabi Yusuf has been doing for, for 30 years, he goes and visits the Saturday and Sunday churches, spends two or three days with them um, doing house visitations, doing spiritual meetings like this one, uh, meeting with the servants, meeting with the boards of the church. And, um, and then after he's done with his visit to um, that church on the Friday and Saturday, he also visits a community, um, and then he goes to the next one. Um, so that's what I've been doing uh, since I've been out for service in, uh, in, in the diocese uh, in Florida. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, um, Your Grace. Um, maybe go on. The third question is, what have been some of the common challenges that you have observed that affect the youth and the church at large in the modern day? And have these concerns changed in the last few years? As I maybe mentioned in the, the youth uh, camp and, uh, and maybe in smaller um, gatherings uh, over meals, um, 
I believe that all the sins in the world, and as we're taught by the scripture, there's nothing new under the sun. So all the sins have always existed, but the difference is our devices and the phones that are in our pockets that expose us to the sins and the challenges um, at any given time throughout our day um, and in, in much abundance. So um, I believe that many of the challenges revolve on us, uh, around us avoiding reality, um, whether it is someone that is uh, addicted to promiscuous relationships or drug use or gaming for excessive amounts of time or even virtual reality itself, um, uh, whether it's dabbling with AI and making things that are fake, we are avoiding the reality of life. And part of that is what, God willing, um, the topic is about this evening, I mean, bearing our cross and, and going through the narrow gate. It's avoiding the reality in this. And there's that there's suffering, there's difficulties in this life, and that we have to make choices. We really have to make choices with our own free will. Things don't just happen um, on their own here. Um, so I believe this is uh, a great challenge in, in our generation. It's nothing new, but it's just amplified because of the devices that we have at our, at our fingertips. Sayyidina, in the modern era, there tends to be like a growing uh, trend where like general commitment to like our relationship to God or even like our commitment to like staying in a certain profession or things like that. Commitment in general seems to be fading away. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of your observations and how can we change that? To be committed to something, I believe we have to um, know. Thank you. We have to know why we're doing it. Um, it's not just haphazard commitment. So when we know uh, the great benefit behind something, we are much more likely to put every effort into it and our desire for it would grow to be faithful. If we don't have anything that we think is worth getting up from bed for, then we will stay in our bed for a lot longer. Um, so when we know the value of the sweetness of the life with God and the joy of the life with God, and the relationship that we can have with God and that he is the creator of the universe. And despite all this, we're not used to this. We're some, sometimes we're unable to accept this thought that God wants nothing from us except for our own good because we're so used to people taking advantage of us or um, we're doing something, yani, uh, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Yani, we do something reciprocal. But God is the one that's always seeking out for us. So our commitment would grow much more, whether in our uh, in our professional life, if we understood the value of the service that we're offering to humanity through our through our job, or um, in our life with God, certainly if we understand the beauty of the life with God. Yeah. Okay, the next question, Sayyidina, is there are many situations that youth encounter in which the solution they are often provided first and foremost is to pray, read the Bible, and fast. However, there are times that it feels like this does not directly deal with the problem or seems to be less than practical advice. What are your thoughts on this? The number one thing is to ask oneself, have I actually prayed, read the Bible, and fasted? That is the number one thing. Many times we think that there is a so-called practical solution, but the saints, uh, maybe the most recent of them that like to repeat this is St. Pope Quillus VI. He would say prayer moves the hands of uh, him who moves the entire world, which is God. So truly, prayer is the solution. However, prayer moves us and gives us the grace of God or the wisdom from God to what practical sex do I, ha do I have to take? Maybe there is a confrontation, there is a falling out between me and a friend or me and a family member. Maybe when I pray for that person, then God will move my ha heart to be softened that I need to go and reconcile with that person. I need to go and ask for forgiveness from that person. I can't just be passive about it and wait for something to happen from their side. Um, if I pray about schooling and getting into programs or getting a job, then I, I also should be pricked in my conscience that I have to make every effort on my part to, to seek out a job and to si find a practical program that my scores and my um, ability would be able to handle. Um, so prayer itself and reading of the scriptures, God guides us through that as to what we should practically do in each um, circumstance. Um, that's why we say we pray St. Augustine would say, pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. You can't just pray and you can't just expect that your diligence or your work is going to um, take the replacement for prayer. No, prayer has its place. We are physical beings and we are spiritual beings by God's grace. God has created us as body and soul. Thank you for that, Sayyidina. 
Um, so next question, there's been like a lot of like questions and um, I guess misunderstanding around the concept of like God and punishment. What is the church's specific views on God in relation to punishment? We know that Adam and Eve were exiled from the paradise of joy. This was an act of punishment from God's part. Um, some can look at it in the church history as a consequence of what they've done. Um, but there is active punishment in the flood. And there is active punishment in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so um, we must understand that uh, the overall thing that we look at as punishment sometimes in a wrong way is hell. Hell is not a punishment. Hell is a choice that people have made to abide in the place that is created for the devil and his angels. Hell is not created for us, for any human being, not any single human being it's created for, but rather God desires the salvation of every soul and that all would come to the knowledge of the truth as St. Paul teaches his disciple, St. Timothy. But um, those who reject God, God is leaving them to their own will um, to not abide with him forever because that would be the greatest torture for them to be forced to live with God here. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that, Sayedna. Um, the next question we have is, what is your advice around being a practicing Christian in the modern world? It can often feel like there are some practices of Coptic orthodoxy that feel out of place in the modern world or are somewhat outdated traditions when it comes to the practice of fasting or attendance of liturgies. Is this a wrong feeling to have? The church is dynamic and it develops. However, it doesn't develop based on our whims. It develops based on um, pastoral need. And our church is very beautiful in that it sets the system. Many churches now that are apostolic churches, I speak of the Roman Catholic Church, I speak of the Eastern Orthodox Church, those are the only other two apostolic families besides the Oriental Orthodox Churches. Um, they are regretting and they look towards the Oriental Orthodox Churches, more specifically the Coptic Church, for upholding what we've received for generations and not letting go of it. And the beauty of that is this, for example, in a time like now during the Great Fast, what time are we supposed to be abstaining from food for? Like for all of us to understand, when we say we're fasting, fasting means not just to eat vegan food, but fasting means to abstain from food for a period of time. So if we're abstaining from food for a period of time, what does the church prescribe for this, this period of the fast? All the weekdays are supposed to be abstained until 6 p.m. The great majority of Coptic Orthodox Christians are not abstaining till 6 p.m. or any time close to 6 p.m. And the liturgies themselves do not, um, do not end at 6 p.m. There are many liturgies that do end at 6 p.m. and maybe later even, but the church is flexible. But it's, it still keeps that rule and teaches that rule. And we see that in praying, for example, the Egbeya prayers. We pray the Egbeya prayers until the 12th hour before the liturgy, even if it's early liturgy, to remind ourselves of this principle. Um, that the majority of the liturgy should be ending later, they shouldn't be ending um, so early. But we are flexible um, in, in what we are offering. Um, each one, and the beauty, again, the great beauty of the Coptic Church is that we each should have a father of confession. With our father of confession, irrespective of our age, irrespective of what stage of life we're in, irrespective of, even I myself, as a bishop, I have a father of confession. All the fathers of confession that you would possibly go to, they have fathers of confession. And we all need to be disciples until the end of our lives. So with our Father of Confession, we determine, is it appropriate for me, I'm just using fasting as an example because we're doing the fasting season. Is it appropriate for me to be fasting and abstaining until 2 p.m., until 3 p.m., until 6 p.m., until 12 p.m., uh, until 8 a.m., whatever it may be. But I have a rule, and that rule is not determined by my whims, by my desires, by my liking. I discuss it with a spiritual father so I can be guided because I need to be discipled. Um, there's an aspect of humility and receiving a blessing. So this is what the church has, has prescribed. We have our ritual, ritual uh, heritage that is Coptic and that anyone that wants to study liturgical history, they come back to the Coptic church because they know that we have upheld the most ancient rites. Um, and, and this is not just uh, being proud of being Coptic. This is a reality that when people study liturgy, they go back to the Coptic rites um, and the liturgical seasons, yeah. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we always feel like we have very busy lives and I'm sure as a bishop, you also have quite a busy life. How do you maintain like your spiritual canon and your spiritual law while also having a lot of commitments and things and meetings I'm sure that you have to also attend? 
all of us have uh, different obligations. And yes, as a bishop, by God's grace, I, I need to travel, I need to prepare things, just like you all, whether uh, you're completing graduate studies or you've finished and you're working permanently, um, or you have families that you're taking care of, or siblings um, or parents that you're taking care of. We all have different obligations. But we should keep in mind that our spiritual canon is not a burden that we complete. Our spiritual canon is the means by which we receive grace to complete everything else in the day. That we determine with our spiritual father, uh, with his guidance, that I need to pray in the morning. I need to start my day with God in the morning. Because let us look at it in this manner. Mahal, what does a canon consist of? A canon consists of, let's say, I'm gonna, what am I going to pray in the morning? What am I going to pray in the evening? What am I going to read in the Bible? Um, I'm going to pray liturgy on Sunday and, and Saturday night, God willing, the, the Vespers and the Praises. These are all cornerstones that we want to establish. I'm going to uh, repent and confess to my Father Confession every month and a half, approximately every 40 days. These are all cornerstones. But then how much am I going to pray? What am I going to pray? Uh, when am I going to pray? All these get determined with discussion with my spiritual father. So when I start my day, just take morning prayer for an example. If I'm not praying in the morning, right, then I'm starting my day without God. But I want God to bless all these different things. To let me at least mention to him, these are the things that I am hoping to do today. Um, and I want your grace to complete them in a manner befitting of me as a Christian. So I, I should at least mention them before him. And he's given me the new day to be able to live with him. So I should at least thank him in the morning. This is the principle of the first hour that I'm offering to him the day. And I'm saying, keep me this day without sin and deliver me. Um, and, and do not allow me, allow me to live a pure and a chaste life today. Um, so uh, I, I need to uh, be reminded I need to, to, to encourage ourselves to have that time. It comes down to saying, let's say my spiritual rule in the morning, I'm going to pray for 10 minutes. That means that whatever time we're setting our alarm for right now, before we have the spiritual rule, before we start applying this, let's say I'm waking up at 6.45. If I wake up at 6.45 every day without praying my rule, that means if I am actually intending to be successful in praying my spiritual canon in the morning, I must set my alarm for at least 6.35. If I do not do that, then I'm not setting myself up for success. I'm setting myself up for failure. But again, the matter of commitment comes into play. I will tell you just you know, maybe a couple things so we understand. If I pray before I leave my house, I may not realize it. It's not going to be a one plus one equation, what I'm going to say right now. But I will be less likely to fall into sin. I will be more likely to observe something holy as opposed to something impure. I will be less likely to continue in sin if I have started sinning. I will be more likely to repent quicker from whatever sin I've committed than to continue to abide in that sin. I will be more likely to think of a godly manner, a godly matter, um, than to think of an evil matter or a sinful or an idle matter because I have begun my day with God. So if I put it in as a, as a non-negotiable, even if it's one minute in the morning, again, discuss with your spiritual fathers, I, I'm saying to myself, I cannot leave my house without God. I need to take him with me. And then as I said, maybe in the youth camp, for those who are there, because I see many faces that were there, that one of the beloved elders in, in the wilderness would say, you need to take the Lord Jesus with you, you need to take the Lord Jesus with you, angaji, right? This word in Arabic that can't be translated easily, right? Hand in hand, take him hand in hand, right? So you're, you're with him and he's with you all the day. And the elder would literally in his uh, simplicity and his holiness, he's looking, saying, are you with me? Are you with me in this endeavor? Am I able to go with you into this place or start this service, or go into this meeting, or go into this class, or meet this client. Um, and, and saying arrow prayers throughout the day is how we keep that communion with God. Some people, I was happy in the, in the youth camp as well, that they gave out these little books, right? These, these uh, little books so you can take notes. Some people like to keep a book, book with them just so they can write throughout the day. And this becomes their fuel or their matters for prayer at the end of the day. When they stand before God, they're writing notes for themselves so they can stand before God and pray with them at the end of the day. Thank you, Sayyidina. So it's about the building those small habits and conditioning yourself in a manner of speaking mm. in terms of practical sets. Mm. Um, so how do I know if my relationship with Christ is truly growing? Sometimes it may feel as though a person can be stuck in the same place in their spiritual life. Mm. Many times we feel this way, but that's why God does not leave us alone. Again, 
many things go back to having a spiritual father. Many things going back to being discipled and saying, I need this. I need this. It's not a question of whether I should do it or not. It's like someone that has a broken leg and says, maybe I'll get by. Right? I need to go to a doctor. Tab, you don't know who this doctor is. Tab, is this doctor perfect? Has this doctor made mistakes? Yeah. This doctor has a doctor. It's the, they say that it's, it's the, the worst patients are doctors. Right? But this doctor is a patient to somebody else. Right? So it's not about the perfection of the father, nor, um, nor, nor the, the, the comfort level that I have. Sometimes you're taking recommendations based on, okay, how do I choose a, a good doctor? I've never broken my leg before, but I need to go to a doctor. Okay, I'm going to ask and see, do I know someone trustworthy that can recommend to me a doctor that has to do with this matter? And the beauty of the priesthood in the church is that God has recommended these people. God has called these people to this responsibility of receiving confession and being accountable before God and help, helping me being accountable before God. Um, it's a different world, it's a different mindset when I have a spiritual father. And this is the answer to this question because I'm not determining whether I'm growing or not. I can't easily see. If someone is growing a fruit garden, let's say they have trees, let's say an, an orange tree or something, and they're planting the seed, Someone that is very well acquainted with orange trees, I'm not sure if it's an orange tree or not, but we've had many trees in our monastery, for example, and some trees, the first three years, you can't eat of their fruit. They're just not good fruit, right? But the person that understands how the tree is supposed to grow would be able to tell you that these branches can be pruned and these branches cannot be pruned and these leaves can be removed and these fruits need to be thrown away. You shouldn't try to eat them. You shouldn't think that something's wrong with the tree if the fruit tastes sour at this point. Um, so we may see all different types of things in our spiritual life, but we go to our spiritual father and many times by the confession that we are saying, by the spiritual um, exercises that we are upholding, by the struggle that we are doing, by the questions that we're asking, by the comments that we're making, by the attendance in spiritual meetings, by our attendance in liturgical prayers, by our desire to confess and to ask once and twice and three times that I need to confess and, and Abuna is very busy during a certain season, but I'm still making it a point. This reveals to the spiritual father many things. Um, and God guides, of course, it's, it's the grace of God, God's Holy Spirit in the end that's guiding the spiritual father to be able to help someone know, are they on the right path or are they not on the right path? Yeah. Uh, um, so Sayyidina, I think you mentioned this actually a lot in the camp, how America and uh, Australia tend to have like, a lot of similar issues, especially within our society and the church more recently has also been struggling with a lot of modern ideology that might differ from our understanding of life as Coptic people. What are some ways that we can live in this world while not being of it, while not being affected by those that surround us in it? Well, we are living in the world and we have a responsibility not only to be living in the world as Christians, but also to sanctify the world. So. Us being reminded, as you said, yes, we did talk about this in the camp, because we have to realize the grace of God in our lives. We have to realize all that we've received from God freely. And so we're in a posture before God of thanksgiving and not of just desiring and making requests. Like one of the exercises I think I mentioned at one point in the camp is we can stand before God for two minutes and thank him. Just to stay 120 seconds before God and to not make a request neither for myself nor for another person nor for something in the church or the service or family members or whatever it may be, but just to stand before him and to thank him, to remind myself of the graces that I've received from God. And then when I'm looking at the options in the world, I'm realizing that God gives me so much more and, and so much more stability, not just things that he's giving me. And the love that I receive from him is much more than I will ever be able to receive temporary from, temporarily, temporarily from the world. Thank you, Sayyidina. Well, that concludes the first segment of the night. I'm going to hand over to our Master of Ceremonies, Damiana. Um, she will take over, and you'll see us again shortly. Thank you, Sayyidina. Thank you, Your Grace, for your insight into those um, questions. That was great. Um, we're just going to do a quick hymn before we switch over into Q&A, if that's all right. So we'll just do that very quickly. Have 
His tender face. Have you seen him, the one I love? Have you seen him, the holy man? Have you heard him, his gentle voice? Have you heard him, the great I am? I was wounded, broken and empty, but His Spirit rushed in and filled me. I was waiting for life and healing, but His sweet eyes alone restored my feeling. Have you seen him, the one I love? Have you seen his gentle voice? Have you heard him, his gentle voice? Have you heard him, the great I am? The oil I poured on him could not consume his sweet aroma it filled the room come and meet him sit at his feet drink in his beauty it set me free have you seen him the one I love, have you seen him, the holy man? Have you heard him, his gentle voice? Have you heard him, the great I am? Okay, thanks for that. Um, Sarah, that was great, thank you. Um, we'll just have your grace join us, please. We'll do the short talk and then we'll jump to Q&A after that. Thank you. Forgive me and pray for me, fathers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, the topic that I was given is, uh, is bearing the cross and uh, speaking about bearing the cross in regards to um, the narrow gate. Yeah, and with an aim, an insight in how we should choose, how we ought to choose the narrow and difficult path as members of the body of Christ and why this is the path of the Christian. So where do we hear about the narrow path and the broad path? And none other than our Lord Jesus Christ's holy mouth when he's speaking in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Um, he says to us, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So he's describing that there are two ways. There is the broad gate and there is the narrow gate. The broad gate is considered easy to walk in, but it leads to destruction. 
and the narrow gate leads to life, but there are few who find it, so we have to be seeking it out, right? There are many who go in by the broad gate, and difficult is the way for the narrow gate. When the fathers teach us about this narrow gate, they're not just talking about it, it's not just the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we recall in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses the arch prophet is talking about the way of blessing and the way of cursing. This is the fifth book in the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy. The way of blessing and the way of cursing. And in the first psalm, in the whole psalmody, King David is saying, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. So he, he's comparing the blessed man that does not walk in these evil things, the, 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 he's, he's not walking in ungodliness, but rather he's walking in godliness and meditating on the words of God. So there are two paths to be chosen, and then the Lord completes it by saying the narrow gate and the broad gate. Especially during this time of the fast, we look at the narrow gate as being part of our ascetic life. This word asceticism, sometimes in some milus it's used a lot, other times it's not used, right? What is asceticism? Asceticism is to discipline, it's self-discipline, right? An avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for a particular reason. For us as Orthodox Christians, our reason is for the relationship with God. So the reason that we're walking on this narrow path is for the relationship with God. The reason that we're bearing our cross is for us to be following our Savior. If we can, um, I don't know if, uh, if there's Coptic reader attached, but we can go to a verse. If not, it's okay. But uh, if there is, then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We read St. Paul saying that we, as the Christians, are looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he's the beginning and the end of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So he sees a joy in front of him as he's on the path of the cross, as he's being scourged, as he's being um, mocked, as he's being betrayed, as he's being denied, as his disciples are forsaking him. He sees a joy in front of him. And this allowed him to endure the cross. He is God incarnate, so he does not need to, to have this. But nonetheless, St. Paul describes it as, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For us, in our modern generation, when you all, as young men and women, you're thinking about the narrow path, you're thinking about fasting, it's not the most joyful thing to think about for most of us. When we're thinking about prostrations, we're thinking about controlling our eyes, controlling our ears, what we're listening to, um, being diligent in our work, um, waking up early, praying late liturgies, standing before God in prayer, serving other people. All this is work. All this is labor. There's a struggle behind this. Taking care of people that are sick, doing acts of mercy. Um, all these things require labor and require effort. And they're not something um, that comes so easily and so natural to us because we're so used to being entertained by these devices. Just sitting back and being entertained. So many times we are looking at it as something that's burdensome. But God makes it light. I want to assure you that we learn in the book of Psalms that the Lord makes the, the narrow path broad, meaning that which is narrow, and it looks like it's narrow, becomes broad. I don't know how many of you know about like different types of animals, but there are certain types of, of uh, mountain goats. You can look them up. I don't remember what their exact name is. But there are certain types of mountain goats that when they climb the mountains, they can climb very steep mountains to the point where it's almost like it's directly vertical. But God has created them in such a way that they're able to have hind feet, right? And Habakkuk talks about this at the end of the, epistle, the, the prophecy of Habakkuk, that we, he's asking for, for hind's feet so that they would be able to climb up this steep mountain, this thing that looks so difficult. For all of us in the world now, especially for you all, if you're on university campuses or in, in work places, then there's constant temptation. Everywhere we look, it's like there's something evil to be seen or something evil to be heard or something wrong to be done or something to be scrolled through that's aimless and idle. 
And so these are constant temptations that are happening around us. And we're constantly having to, to control ourselves, right? Self-control is so difficult. Um, but we know that the Lord who allows us to be born and raised in this generation will give us the grace that he gave, the same grace that he gave to the previous generations when they were tempted with all different types of things as he gave to us. Um, when we think about AI and virtual reality and um, all these things that we don't know much about, right? And even COVID that passed and, and we, don't, we still don't know the, what exactly happened, what was going on. Um, all these different topics. We are so used to the internet and apps and, and smartphones that it's nothing to us before. In previous generations, it was a very big deal to have a phone that you can now contact someone directly, right? But God gave grace to those people that were experiencing these new things. The airplane was very new at one point. Having a car was very new at one point. These were things that the, the, the world had to get used to. And there were sins that were now made available to the people that were not available to them before because of this technology. Being able to take a picture. Like, I can tell you that St. Basil the Great, in one of his letters, he speaks about not allowing yourself to be filled, to have your mind filled with the face of a person of the opposite gender. He's speaking, he's writing a letter to a man, so he's saying, do not let your your mind be filled with the face of a woman. Take that in for a second. Do not let your mind be filled with the face of a woman. Or for women, do not let your mind be filled with the face of a man. What does that mean? That means that to stare at the face of a man or a woman so long that you would be able to remember them outside of their presence. Now, we can do that at any time because of pictures, number one, and because of these devices, definitely, right? But before, to look at the face of a woman in St. Basil's time, you'd have to have the woman in front of you or the man in front of you, right? And you're looking at them. They're being imprinted. It was very difficult and very expensive to have a painting of somebody, right? So these are huge temptations, huge temptations that we, we can't even fathom the depth of, of the idleness that we experience on a regular basis because it's so normal around us. But I want to comfort you in the midst of saying all these things when we're talking about bearing the cross and walking on the narrow path. There's a saying of Abba Eschairon that I mentioned in the, um, in the uh, youth camp. Just want to get it for you. Abbas Khairun, it's very encouraging, so listen carefully. He says, the Holy Fathers were making predictions about the last generation, the last generation before the second, of crumb, second coming of Christ. They said, what have we ourselves done? One of them, the great Abbas Khairun, replied, we ourselves have fulfilled the commandments of God. This is in the fourth century. Abbas Khairun is saying, we fulfilled the commandments of God. Right? The others replied, and those who come after us, what will they do? So people in a century later. You can think about this for our generation now. Let's say we were all obeying the commandments of God. Okay? In the next generation, what's going to happen? The others replied, those who come after us, what will they do? He said, they will struggle to achieve half of our works. They will struggle to achieve half of our works. Half of the commandments of God will be obeyed. Right? He said... Sorry, they said, and to those who come after them, so three generations from us, right? Or really two generations from us. What will happen? He said, the men of that generation, the men of that generation, two generations from us, will not accomplish any works at all. Will not accomplish any works at all. And temptation will come upon them. And those who will be approved in that day will be greater than either us or our fathers. I'm going to read the last part again. The men of that generation will not accomplish any works at all, 
and temptation will come upon them, and those who will be approved in that day will be greater than either us or our fathers, the ones who fulfilled all the commandments, and the ones who fulfilled half the commandments. Right? So we should be mindful that God is well aware, much more than we can even imagine, because he's God, of all the temptations that are available to us all the time, in the workplace, in campuses, in family life, um, in the service, in our hobbies, and any, any little thing. The temptations are all available to us. And why do we work, and, and as we go about our lives, and you're all young professionals, right, to get food and drink and clothing. And the Lord tells us, don't worry about these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things, right? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. They say that it is actually St. John Chrysostom, when he talks about um, fasting and the narrow gate and, and the, the simplicity of life, he says the greatest hunger, sorry, the greatest spice is hunger. The best spice on food is hunger. Because when you're hungry, it makes everything taste much better. So he says, someone that can eat, this is St. John Chrysostom, he says, someone that can eat anything at any time, he doesn't enjoy the food as much as someone that is eating whatever he can get his hands on so that he would be able to sustain himself. He says, this person enjoys the food usually more than the person that can get any and everything at any time because they get bored with the food. They can have it any time, right? He also says, when we acquire Oh, well, this is part of what not walking on the narrow gate and bearing our cross in the midst of this world is, to live a simple life. So the one who is walking, he says back in the day they would use sandals. So he says the one who's wearing a sandal that fits him can walk and can run. The one who's wearing a sandal that is oversized, that is a large sandal, what does that prevent him from doing? It prevents him from running and walking normally and swiftly. So he says likewise is the one who has many possessions, He's comparing it specifically to a big house. He's saying, big sandal, big house. You cannot run to the kingdom as easily with the many possessions. And he's teaching us that when we fast, for example, for those who have experienced abstaining, or especially during Beskha week, we have these long services, right? It's not about drinking something specific. We just want water at that point. Just want water. Just want some morsel of bread, something to sustain us. Because we've experienced that it's not about the tastes of it. There's an actual need that's arising inside of us. I don't know about here in Australia, but it's becoming more popular to do intermittent fasting, right? Is it popular here? Yeah, I think so, right? So that's not spiritual fasting necessarily. You can combine it with spiritual fasting, with direction, but that doesn't mean that you're spiritually fasting, right? But it... it it's something to question in ourselves if we are okay with doing intermittent fasting and not okay with fasting according to the prescription of the church. Something to question. What is our priority? Where are we getting our information from? Where, we, where is our authority in this life? What, what do we think is beneficial for us? Is it just for our body or is it for our souls? So um, those who, who go through those intermittent fastings, right, Water and simple food is important. And actually, they talk about those who are fasting for extended periods of time to eat simple food afterwards. The, the narrow path is open, is open to us, and it's called the gates of righteousness. So the narrow gate is also called in the scriptures the gates of righteousness, to walk in the commandments of God. Um, the narrow path for King David, for example, was to do his job. What was his responsibility as a king when he fell into adultery and murder with Bathsheba and then killing her husband Uriah the Hittite? Why was, what, what caused him to fall into adultery? What caused him to sin and to not walk in the narrow path? What was he not doing? Or where was he supposed to be? Supposed to be at war. Supposed to be at war. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read in the first verse, the scripture is not haphazard. It says that we were he was supposed to, it was a time when kings went out to war. And king David is a king, but he didn't go out to war. So what was he doing? He was on his rooftop 
And his eyes were looking around at the kingdom. And he sees Bathsheba bathing. And he asks for her and he commits adultery. And then he commits murder by killing her husband to try to hide his adultery. Right? What was the cause of his sin? Idleness. His idleness. His not walking on the narrow path of fulfilling his responsibility, which was to go out to war at that time. So for us, what does that translate into? Okay, I have work I have to do. I have a service I have to do. I have prayers that I'm responsible for in between me and my father confession. I have a brother or a sister that's in need of help. I have parents that are asking me for tours around the house. I have even services in the church, right? I have responsibilities in this life. Those are graces, as I mentioned in the camp, right? When did work begin for Adam and Eve? For those who weren't in the camp, you can try and guess, right? So we can get the, the Australian accent again, yeah. What, when did work begin for Adam and Eve? Was it before or after the fall? The fall or after? The fall or after? Before. It was before. It was before the fall, right? Before the fall. It wasn't after the fall. Work is not part of the discipline or the punishment or the consequence of sin. Work is something that was given by God to Adam and Eve as a gift, as a grace, as a means to work with God, as a means to participate in tilling the ground and producing the fruits that God could have made appear just with nothing happening. But he allows us to participate in his work. So when we do our work faithfully, then we are prevented from many temptations. And this is part of walking on the narrow path, just to be faithful. The Lord was rewarding and saying, faithful and wise steward. Faithful and wise steward. They were faithful and they were wise. Good and faithful servant, right? This faithfulness is very important. That I'm not trying to cut corners because other people are affected. If I do my professional job in a less than faithful manner, right? Then other people get affected, right? St. Jerome, just as a caveat about King David's sin, St. Jerome, he says to us, notice here in King David's situation, where did he fall into sin? Where was he? He was on the rooftop of where, of his own house. So St. Jerome says, notice here how even in his own house, a man cannot use his eyes without danger. Notice here how even in his own house, a man cannot use his eyes without danger. And he's speaking in the 4th and 5th century, St. Jerome. But now we have these guys, right? So we should be mindful that the rooftops now are, Yanni, I don't know about Australia. I don't think you have many rooftops here that you're going to stand on top of and just watch uh, people, right? You don't have that here. Um, but these are our rooftops in which people can scroll through social media and people can look at any and everything, right? And likely, likely, if we are idly on the internet in some way, shape, or form, then we will fall into sin. We will fall into sin. One more example of the narrow path is our ears. What are we listening to? What are we listening to? Of course, there's the big principle of music and the inappropriate lyrics, but also the beats. I remember maybe 20 years ago or so, Embassy Riel, may God keep him for the church, he came and gave us uh, a family convention, and I was, I believe, in college or something at that time, and I remember him talking about a controlled study between two plants, right? One, that it was in one condition, one in the same exact condition in another place, one had classical music playing, and the other one had... Um, at the time, rock music was popular, so they had rock music playing, right? So this plant, same water, same sunlight, same nutrients, same everything. And the classical plant flourished normally. And the one with rock music withered. Does the plant, does the plant understand the lyrics? The plant doesn't understand the lyrics, right? Just the vibrations. Just, just the, the beat, right, has an impact on us more than we can imagine, more than we can imagine. So it's not just about the lyrics being inappropriate, it's about the beat. St. John of Deliatha, who's known as the spiritual elder, St. John Saba, 
he was a Syrian monk of the 6th or 7th century. He says, You who desire for yourself purity, whereby the Lord of all may be seen. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Right? We desire this purity. He's talking about purity of heart. But he's saying part of this purity. He says, Do not slander, so don't speak evil, nor listen to words of calumny, so also speaking evil, um, concerning your brethren. So don't speak evil, nor listen to words of speaking evil. If a quarrel is going on near you, or if you hear angry words, stop up your ears and flee, lest your soul perish. And those who are at the camp remember when I give an example of the monk that was walking and saying akhtit, right? Trying to avoid listening to the words, lest he hear someone's name, lest he hear a situation, and he fall into judgment. Abba Isaiah of Shahid, he was the teacher of St. Arsenios, he says, if you protect your ears, your tongue will not sin. If you protect your ears, your tongue will not sin. So another important aspect of walking in the narrow gate is our speech. And when we speak about speech, we should be mindful whenever we're reading in the scriptures anything about the tongue, we should be mindful that text messages and sending pictures or sending videos or sharing links, right? That's all part of what the tongue verses and the tongue commands are comprising, right? Because there was no texting back in the day. There was no sending of videos back in the day. But this is a way of communication. So the tongue is the way that God gave us as a way of communication. Now we can also type with our fingers. So all those commandments apply to, um, apply also to texting. There's a beautiful story that's told about a um, person from the 15th or 16th century. He was a father confessor. And one of his spiritual daughters came to him and she confessed um, slandering and, uh, and gossiping. And so he wanted to teach her. He felt like she didn't understand the depth of the, the, the harm that's done by gossiping and slandering. So he told her back in the day, it sounds weird to us, right? But most of our grandparents and great grandparents, when they wanted to eat chicken, what did they do? What did they do when they wanted to eat chicken? What did they do? They got to kill the chicken. Right? Who kills the chicken? Get the they killed the chicken. Right? They killed it somewhere in the house. Or they didn't go somewhere outside. Right? It was somewhere in the house. So, at the time, there were butchers. And you can go to the butcher shop and get the, the, the chicken um, with their head uh, removed, so basically they're dead, and you can get it defeathered, or you can get it with its feathers on, and you pay less money that way. So this father confessor told his spiritual daughter, I want you to go to the butcher shop and get me a chicken, and don't let the, the butcher defeather it. I want you to defeather it on the way. Sounds disgusting to us, but this is not so disgusting back then. Right? So she did and she got the chicken, and she's defeathering it on the way in obedience to her spiritual father, and she brings the chicken to her father. Here you go. Thank you. Now I want you to go and pick up all the feathers that you defeathered on the way here. And she said to him, that's impossible, I can't do that. And he said to her, likewise, with whatever words of gossip you have said, whatever slander has been said, and for us, whatever text messages have been sent, whatever group messages have been sent, whatever picture has been sent, whatever video has been shared, whatever link has been shared. Once we do it, it is done, right? And we are responsible for it. So our tongue is very powerful. It is certainly a very narrow gate that we must walk in when it comes to our tongue. Certainly a very narrow gate. That's why St. James says, no man can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. And St. Augustine says, just like St. James is saying, no man can tame the tongue, that means we cannot. That what are we supposed to do? Like, I'm telling you about this, that what am I supposed to do? He says, just like an animal does not tame itself, like you don't find dogs taming dogs. You don't find kangaroos here taming kangaroos, right? You find human beings taming these animals, right? So someone greater than the animal has to tame it. And so likewise, St. Augustine says, we cannot tame our own tongue. We must call upon God and say, God, tame my tongue. And likewise, purify my eyes, purify my ears, purify my tongue. And that all leads us to purity of heart. Um, 
again, the verse that the Lord Jesus Christ said that we began with, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. The majority of the world will go in by it, right? Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. One thing I want to, um, I think I went on a tangent, I didn't explain the, the, the goats, right? The mountain goats, did I explain that? I don't think I finished that thought. I just went off on a tangent. So what happens, it's very narrow for them to walk on these paths up the mountain or to walk up a vertical mountain. But what ends up happening, God has made them in such a way that they can walk up the mountain. So what seems very narrow to us and impossible, indeed very impossible for a human being to do, God makes possible for them. So that path which seems to be very difficult to walk on, very narrow, very dangerous even, um, very sorrowful, very bitter, very burdensome. God makes it joyful. God makes it a source of peace for us because we will suffer in this world. There will be suffering in this world. There will be offenses in this world. But are we going to suffer according to the will of God, as St. Peter says? Are we going to suffer according to us seeking after certain pleasures? Right? or temporal, temporal matters in this world. So God makes the narrow path broad for us. He makes it seem like it's a joyful path to walk on. And it is. It becomes narrow. Just like the mountain goat is not fearful of falling. It's walked on this path many times. Think of, practically speaking, think of like a paved road versus like a dirt road with lots of, of bumps on it and, and dirt piled all over the place. Right? Like on my way to the monastery in the car, I don't know, who's repairing these roads, but when, when they repair the road, they, they're putting, it seems like they're just taking a bunch of asphalt and saying, okay, there's a hole here, put the asphalt there, right? So it's, it, it's, it's not the, the, the smoothest path, right? But for someone who's used to walking in an in a, in a, in a untrodden uh, road or a, or a not so flat path, they get used to it, they know how to walk through it. Like a monk that's walking through the sand in Egypt that's used to walking through the sand in Egypt is different from myself or yourself, right, that we're not used to walking through sand. You can walk. It's not making them heavy. It's not so tiresome for them because they're used to it, right? So he makes the narrow path broad. And we should know that um, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's speaking about temptations and persecutions, he says it is an opportunity for us to witness to him because everyone in the world is going through different sufferings. But when we endure the sufferings, like those who have suffered different illnesses, for example, in the recent path, Saint Abun of Choy Kamil, he suffered from cancer. And it's a very difficult disease. It's a very torturous disease in terms of the treatment and, and, and all the suffering and the pain that happens. But he made that path a path of salvation. He when he was thankful in the midst of his disease, it preached to the world and served the world in a way that he wasn't able to serve when he was with full strength, despite the fact that he was a faithful servant. So we should know that despite the sufferings and the difficulties and the narrow path that's in front of us, people are looking for purity. People know that they're being enslaved to videos and they're being enslaved to scrolling on social media and the idleness of it. And, and that's what's causing a lot of anxiety and suffering in the world right now. And a lot of focus on mental health because people are just self-indulging in, in these devices. So we should take hope from God that he, has, he knows this from the very beginning. So he teaches us the narrow path. And instead of suffering after indulging in the temporal pleasures, then we are of our own selves submitting ourselves to the way of God. And we're remembering we're looking unto Jesus. Our eyes are always on the Lord, not on the sins that we're fighting against. Our eyes are on the Lord, despite whatever sins we've committed, because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he is the one who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we also, we'd be called with the cross bearers that love God. They, they, they endure the sufferings for the sake of their love for God, as we say in the fraction for the great fast. May God grant us to, to, to receive grace from him, to walk faithfully as those who came before us walked, 
and looking unto Jesus, always keeping him in front of our eyes and keeping the cross in front of our eyes, that we would know that this suffering leads to glory and to joy in the end. To our God be the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Sayedna, for that lovely talk. Um, we are going to go into the final segment of tonight, which was um, the Slido questions. So, Sayedna, we had a Slido link that's been put up for two weeks now, I think it was, and it was just people asking anonymous questions. So, with your um, grace, if you're okay with that, we'll just ask you the questions and just give you a chance to answer it. Okay. Okay, so the first question, Sayedna, is what does it mean to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is a verse that St. Paul says, and every thought into captivity, where do our thoughts come from? Practically, our senses produce the thoughts. So when I look at something, I have a picture, just like we were talking about St. Basil before and not being filled, not having our eyes filled with the face of the person of the opposite gender. So likewise, that, that is a, like a picture that's invented in my mind. That creates a thought. I listen to something. I smell something. I can then imagine that in my mind again. That creates the thoughts. So I want my senses and my whole being, my thoughts are constantly running. I want them to be befitting of me as a Christian. The Lord says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So where is the place of thought? And I bring every thought into captivity. The place of thought is in our heart according to the spiritual realm, uh, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, not just our mind. So bringing every thought into captivity is to make all of my thoughts befitting of Christ. And so when I have, what do I do when I have a greedy thought or a selfish thought or a proud thought or a lustful thought or a lazy thought or a gluttonous thought or a judgmental thought? I cut it off by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say, my Lord Jesus Christ, help me. I thank you, my Lord Jesus Christ. Save me, my Lord Jesus Christ. My Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I cut it off with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so that I would bring it into captivity. If it's something wrong, I'm casting it out. I'm not letting it stay inside. I'm bringing it into captivity. The Lord is the one that's holding it captive. Um, the next question reads, how can we cultivate an orthodox mind for spiritual growth? What's your stance on reading Eastern Orthodox texts and how do we determine their orthodoxy? Sorry, can you repeat the first part? Yep. How can we cultivate an orthodox mind for spiritual growth? St. Athanasius says that the orthodox church and the church at large that the Lord Jesus Christ established is what the Lord taught, the apostles preached, and the fathers kept. So we should keep in mind, there's a phrase that I like. I don't know where it came from, but I, I repeat it a lot. I tried to look for a source. I could not find a source. I believe in the Bible given to me by the church because the church came before the Bible and the church determined these are the books of the Bible, not the other way around. I believe in the Bible given to, me, given to me by the church, interpreted by the fathers, lived by the saints, and prayed in the liturgy. I'll say it again. I believe in the Bible, the words of the Bible, the scripture that we all need to read, right? Given to me by the church, church determined which books are part of the Bible, interpreted by the fathers. I read the commentary of the church fathers about the verses. I know when I read the lives of the saints, I see the commandments being fulfilled in their lives. And when I pray in the liturgy, the liturgy is summarizing the entire scripture for me. Liturgy not just meaning the Eucharistic liturgy, but tazbaha and baptismal prayers and wedding prayers and funeral prayers and... Um, all different types of raising of morning and evening incense and, and beska prayers and all of it. It teaches me the entire the entirety of the scriptures, yani, the proper interpretation. As for reading Eastern Orthodox books, I mentioned this principle in a small gathering in, in somewhere in, while I was here in Australia, um, that for every two or three books that we read um, that are from the church fathers, not just contemporary fathers, but from the church fathers, then we can read one other book from outside of them. This way we ensure that our framework is from the Orthodox Church. For many of you listening to me, I don't know, I, I pray that you're all reading the church fathers, right? But that may seem very heavy. But some of us, I realize, are not aware 
of the simple writings of the church fathers. It's not just scripture commentary, although many writings of them are scripture commentary, but there are homilies on envy. So if I'm struggling with envy, I can read St. Basil's homily on envy. I can read St. Basil's homily on anger if I'm struggling with anger. I can read his homily on humility if I'm struggling with pride. I can, uh, if I'm struggling with thoughts, I can read his homily on take heed to yourself. If I'm thinking about the judgments and, and punishment and all the, the topics that I was asking about, I can read, there's a homily that he has on uh, the judgment of God. So the, the fathers wrote about all these different topics and I'm sure that the fathers, yani either themselves or they have a sources they can go to to turn to understand which, which fathers wrote about what and where I can go to um, for, uh, for answers to the questions here. So I, I don't recommend just reading Eastern Orthodox writings I recommend reading the Church Fathers' writings, the early Church Fathers' writings, and the early Desert Fathers' writings. Thank you for answering that, Your Grace. Um, the next question, I know you touched on it in your talk a bit, um, but this is from a slightly different angle. In what ways do you believe our Orthodox community can better address mental health challenges such as loneliness and isolation that are prevalent in today's society? Certainly they are, as I mentioned, more prevalent and I believe that one of the main reasons is because of the devices and the fact that someone can spend so much more time alone and yet somehow they don't seem like they're alone because they have a device and they're maybe playing a game or they're maybe scrolling through seeing other people's faces and so in a sense we're deceiving our own mind and so it creates problems for our mind. How can we serve in this capacity? Thanks be to God I believe that mental health professionals in the Coptic Orthodox Church are increasing um, and there is uh, there should not be confusion between receiving mental health help and spiritual help right they are not the same thing however they are related certainly to one another right psychology is the study of the self and the fathers taught us to know ourselves helps us to know God. And knowing God helps us to know ourself, right? So that is the true psychology, to, to know God and to know ourself as God created us. Many times it's a matter of comparing ourselves to one another that causes us the anxiety. Um, and so I would recommend number one, um, this is not to belittle the mental health aspect, but I should examine and ask myself, where is my spiritual life? Where is my relationship with my God? Wh where do I stand, right? So I can know maybe there's something that I'm doing in this aspect. I'm trying to live my life without God. That doesn't just cause spiritual problems. That causes mental issues and it causes physical issues because I'm not able to deal with the normal struggles of life. So I, I'm responsible for examining the spiritual part. As for the, for the mental health, there are now, um, I can speak for our diocese. We have a service called SMS, Sound, Mind, and Spirit, and we gather together different um, mental health professionals, and they try to offer little bite-sized courses on different matters like depression, anxiety, and uh, anger management, and things like this. And they're available. I, I want to say that they're available for free online. You just have to s sign up for them, I think. Um, I'm not sure if there's a cost or anything involved, but I think they're for free online. If you go to suscops.org, in the program section, there's SMS, and you'll find it there again. So there are some sources that are being presented there. Um, thank you for referencing that. It's actually a really good um, uh, thing to reference back to. Um, the next question reads, people think orthodoxy can prove God logically, but only through a spiritual manner. How can we respond or prove God's existence logically or in theory alone? <coughs> can you please repeat it? Yeah. Um, so it says, people think orthodoxy cannot prove God logically, but only through a spiritual manner. How can we respond or prove God's existence logically or in theory alone? I'll be honest, I can't, I can't answer the logical question. I don't think that, um, I think it's as simple as looking at nature. I, I have not studied philosophy to be able to answer it in that manner that I think the, the question is asking for me to answer it in. So I know that I'm not answering directly the question because to me it's as simple as looking at nature and seeing that there must be a creator. And scientists that have studied this 
يعني say that there must be an intelligent designer behind it and there's um, the fine tuning of the universe as scientists call it prove that there was someone fine tuning it that there's there's certain qualifications that if they were different like gravity and and uh, mass and all the, I mean you all probably know much more than I do I don't even know what I don't want to just mess up and say anything these these calculations are very fine tuned to the to the degree that if it was one degree off and I don't mean one out of a hundred I mean one out of like billions and billions and billions one one of those degrees off then life would not be able to be sustainable on earth and there are books and things written about this the one that I can remember off the top of my head is a book called um, timeless truth for truthless times Timeless Truth for Truthless Times. It's written by George Vassilius. Um, he's uh, one of the Coptic Orthodox faithful from, um, from the U.S. Yani. So it, it talks about some of the uh, aspects of the existence of God, so maybe that would be helpful to, to those who are asking. Um, so yeah, the, the next question just happened to be my luck that I have to ask this one. I've read it twice, and I know it's a bit personal, so please don't shoot the messenger. Um, the question goes... Have you, as a monk living a monastic life, experienced moments of uncertainty or doubt in your journey? And if so, how have you reconciled with these feelings? I believe that any human being will suffer the temptations of the devil, and one of them is doubt. So certainly, yes. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm submitting to the doubts. What does it mean to be faithful? To be faithful is not to experience no doubt, or to experience to have, yeah, is to have no doubt at all. To be faithful is that despite whatever doubts happen, I'm going to struggle through them. To be courageous, to put it another way, to be courageous is not to have no fear. Everyone has fear. But to be courageous is to say that despite whatever fears I have, I'm going to continue to press on. So we will all experience different doubts. Um, and what do I do, I, if, if the question was asking something like this? Yani, I need to, number one, look at the faithfulness of God towards me in my past. All of you are young professionals in one way, shape, or form. You've lived maybe two decades, three decades, four decades, I don't know, maybe some, a couple more. Um, when we look at our past, then we see that God has been faithful at times when I was not faithful. So even though I doubted him, but he still showed me. He doesn't, I don't know everything. I don't know every reason why all these things are happening in my life. Certainly, nobody knows that, right? But I can put a degree of faith in God because of my experience thus far in life. And we all trust one another. And when we go to a mechanic shop, right, with our car, we trust that person with our car. We don't know what they're doing to it. When we go to a doctor, we're trusting them with what they're going to do to our bodies and what recommendations and the medicine and we trust the pharmacy for putting whatever they're going to put in those pills, right? We have a degree of faith. So from our experience with those things, we don't doubt every time we go to a restaurant that someone will poison our food. That would be ridiculous, right? But we look at these situations and we say, okay, because no one has suffered these things, therefore I can now have faith. So we look at ourselves in our relationship with God and we look at others in their relationship with God, and it helps us to establish our faith more. The, the disciples themselves has increased our faith. They, did, they asked for the Lord to increase their faith. And they lived with God in front of them for three and a half years. They lived with him in front of him, and they still said increase our faith. The man that wanted his, I believe, a servant or a son to be healed, he says, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. There are doubts. That's okay. doesn't mean we leave them alone. doesn't mean we say, okay, Yanni, this is uh, something uh, um, that I'm going to focus on. No, but we can be faithful. We continue to, to persevere in our faith. Um, Your Grace, we had very many questions come through, but it's been narrowed down to the last two now. So your second last question reads, when things happen in the world that disrupt our peace, is it okay to feel scared, even though we must have faith and it shouldn't stop us? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what I was saying before applies that uh, we can be fearful, and fear does not negate cur courage, uh, courage. Fear does not negate courage. So we can continue to be courageous. 
Um, and there are things that will disturb our peace. That's why the Lord says in the world there will be tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Right before that verse, he's saying he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. Um, so despite whatever sufferings there is, the Lord is our source of stability. He's the one that we run to for stability. It's just like a little child with their father, right? A little child can be walking, right, on the ground, on the sidewalk, right, and there's someone walking their dog. I mean, some little kids really love dogs, right? But let's say it's one of those kids that doesn't like dogs, okay? So they'll be really afraid of the dog. But if they're in the hands of their father, right, then they're not going to be as afraid as if they're on the ground the same level as the dog, right? They're being protected. They know that they're with their father. It doesn't matter where they are. There could be a snowstorm going on. There could be a rainstorm going on. There could be thunder and lightning, whatever. But if they're in the hands of their father, then they're not as afraid. Why? Because they're protected. They know they're protected by the Lord. Right? So the sense of God's presence, remembering God's presence, in his presence is fullness of joy. And it's his presence, in his presence is protection. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, my light, the, the, Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Right? So I'm with him. As we said in, in the conference, Annie, the, the devil is very powerful, much more powerful than any of us or all of us collectively, right? And St. Saint, Saint Anthony said, I am weaker than your weakest. But with God, the devil is nothing. We make the sign of the cross and the devil fears. Just making the sign of the cross, he's afraid of us. He's afraid of a, of a piece of wood that's made crosswise. He's afraid of it. He can't stand it. The name of Jesus burns him. He can't stand it. If someone does a prostration when they're by themselves, it burns him. He can't stand it. One of the elders in the monasteries, he was living in the 40s and 50s, and he, he went to visit a monastery, um, and he visited one of the elders that was an elder at that time in the 40s and 50s. So it's a classic question that you would ask when you meet an elder. Tell me about your elders. So he said, what am I going to tell you? Uh, when we would walk to Tazbaha, we would hear the demons screaming and saying, woe to us because of the monks who are burning us with their prayers. That's what they would hear. They would hear it with their ears. This is recorded. Woe to us because of the monks who are burning us with their prayers. Right? The prayers destroy the demons. They can't stand it. Right? And that's why I was saying in the conference, if we are with God... God, in, in, in Exodus chapter 15, which we praised in the first hour, in the first whole story, he says, you blew with your wind, the sea covered them, right? So the, the chariots and, and Pharaoh and his horsemen that are running after are going to kill all the Israelites. You blew with your wind. The devil's destroyed. Destroyed. Nothing. He did, he, he, it's easy as that for God, right? But by ourselves, we're nothing. We're weak. We're weaker than his weakest. Right? Thank you, Sayyid. Now we're up to the last question for the night. I know you're pretty tired. Uh, we won't take much of your time. Um, the last question reads, why do bad things happen to my family, and why does God not stop it from happening? I feel anger towards God, and I'm not sure how I can overcome my anger and hurt. Hmm. Suffering is a part of our life, beloved, in this life. Suffering is a part of our life in this life. And God has made it so that the suffering, I, I empathize with you, whoever's asking this question, because there are times in which we're really facing a lot and it's too much on us. And even St. Anthony faced these periods of time. St. Paul, in his epistles, he talks about asking, he begged God three times for the thorn in the flesh that he was suffering from to be removed. And God's response to him was not that he would remove it, despite that this is the great St. Paul, that he's preaching the gospel, that he's serving in so many places. He wrote like a, a, at least a quarter of the, of the New Testament. Why don't you heal him so he can do much more? Just like sometimes we're begging God and we're saying, this person that I love is sick, right? Who was sick and the Lord was told about him? Lazarus. He says, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. Lord, the one whom you love is sick. When St. Augustine comments on this verse, he says that they did not ask him, Mary and Martha did not ask the Lord to come and heal him. Why? Because he said, 
it was enough for them to let him know that the one whom he loves is sick because they trusted in his providence. And that's very difficult at a time when someone that you love is sick. But God sees that faith. And it's a reminder when we see suffering, physical suffering, that we didn't bring upon ourselves, nor did the people that we love bring it upon themselves. It, it causes us to realize the temporality of this life, that this life is temporary, that we will all depart this life. So it reminds us of the heavens. We don't want to be reminded in that way because these are loved ones to us. God has given to us our loved ones and our family members especially for a period of time to grow in our relationship with him through, him, through them. But all of us will depart this life. But we need to be mindful that all of us suffer in different ways. Sometimes the suffering of people is well known to everybody. And sometimes the suffering of people is not known to anybody. Nobody. We would hope that they would at least confide in a spiritual father to be able to get direction. But unfortunately, sometimes people don't take the grace of God that they have available to them which in, in the form of people around them. So I would advise you to seek direction from a spiritual father as to how to navigate through the suffering that you're experiencing or a faithful servant to understand yani, how you should navigate about it. But all of us experience different sufferings. Some people it's with physical ailments. Some people it's with lack of people being around. Some people from the beginning of their life they face disabilities. Some people at the end of their life they face much suffering. Some people can't find jobs. Some people are, uh, they can't have children. Some people have uh, natural disasters facing them. Um, all, all different types of things. Some people are wrongfully accused and put in prison or, or suffering in different ways. Some people are attacked in different ways. But there's all different types of, of sufferings. Um, but all of us experience them. And we are not only to experience and to grow in our relationship with God through our own suffering, but also through the times of our loved ones. And many times, beloved, it's much more difficult for us to watch someone we love suffer than for us to suffer. We say to ourselves, let me take it. I wish it was me. Let me suffer this. I don't want to watch them go through this. Right? That's very difficult. That helps us to understand something that's very deep, which I have no place to talk about. But um, the Father sent the Son into the world to die. The Father sent the Son into the world to die. So it wasn't himself. It's, uh, it's, uh, he, he allowed Piani that the son, the only begotten son of the father would die. So it's uh, uh, Isaac being sacrificed as opposed to Abraham offering his own life. Right? Very, very, the beloved son is, is the one that's being offered. So God hears and knows your suffering um, when you have a loved one that's suffering and you yourself are suffering because of that. Yeah. Sayedna, on behalf of all the youth sitting here before you and the ones on the live stream tonight, we just wanted to say thank you so much for gracing us with your presence and for the beautiful spiritual nourishment. I, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of everyone that we have been rejuvenated tonight um, and we're ready to go out into there and you know spread the word that you have shared with us tonight. We also wanted to thank um, His Grace Bishop Yusuf, Bishop, His Eminence, sorry, His Eminence Bishop Yusuf, my apologies, and... <laughs> And yourself, um, I wanted to thank um, all the youth who've come from all the churches um, near and far. I know we have Kirui, St. Bohomius Church, we've got Abu Safian Rhodes, we've got St. Cosman and Damien from Kellyville, and anyone else who's come from other churches, so thank you so much. And Abuna, sorry, I'm, which? Wollongong. St. Paul and? And St. Peter from Wollongong, sorry. Obviously, I made a lot of stuff up tonight, so my apologies. Um, so, yes, thank you so much. And I wanted to say thank you to God, first and foremost, because without him, we wouldn't be here tonight. So that is all from me. I'm going to hand over to Abun Abshoi Kemal, who's going to close up. Thank you. Uh, Abun, my apologies. We do love Wollongong. It is still part of Sydney. We haven't forgotten about St. Uh, Paul and St. Peter. We, we love you, even though you're a bit south, but we love you. So, no, I couldn't, I couldn't put it more... Um, more better than the guys had. Thank you so much for gracing us and thank you for the wonderful word about the narrow gate. I think it's a wonderful preparation for us as we come to Passion Week and start really considering which path are we on. And even though it is the narrow gate that God, who is the maker of things possible, even though they seem impossible to us, to make it wide. We ask you, Sayyidina, to always please keep us in your prayers and we hope that this is only the 
first of many visits to come that you spend with us. We promise not to have so many questions next time, perhaps. I know that we, uh, we indulge in a lot of questions, but that's just because we love spending time with your grace. Uh, God willing, we will, after this, we'll take a photo with uh, his grace, um, with everyone, so you can stay seated. We'll get someone to take a photo. Uh, and then we'll ask His Grace to just bless the fathers for a few minutes in the Father's room. And then His Grace will come, with His Grace's permission, come and uh, join us in all the wonderful activities that we've got. So we've all got in the Canonia and the Vigola areas, there's uh, food, fellowship, uh, sports, volleyball. Uh, and we thank the wonderful servants for making a lot of activities uh, possible today. And finally and foremostly, we thank His eminence, uh, Metropolitan Yusuf, for giving us the opportunity to spend this time with your grace. We love him very much. And we can see that uh, the southern U.S. is full of so many wonderful uh, and precious treasures, and we were just so happy to be able to benefit from some of these treasures today. Thank you so much, your grace. And we ask you to please come and take a photo with us uh, and with the whole congregation, the fathers. I just want to end by saying you... The same thing that I said in the convention and I keep on saying because I just received it, Tian, which is that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you and this is not from my mouth, it's from the mouth of that elder in the middle of the wilderness that's been living his life with God for many decades. He loves you and he wants you to know how much he loves you. And only when we realize God's love for us and his mercy towards us and his grace towards us that we'll be able to share it with anybody, even the most dearest person to us we must have it, we must realize it to be able to share it with somebody else. So don't ever forget this and let this be if you are serving, which at your age, many most of you should be serving. Make sure that this is the message you're delivering to the people. Doesn't mean that there is not a justice, right? It means that God loves us. We must understand that it is true, genuine love and he cares for us. And sometimes they're disciplined, sometimes they're suffering, but it is genuine love and we should never forget this yet. So, so I don't, we're not going to do a countdown. We're just going to give Jess the opportunity, just one more minute, just to kind of everyone focus, put on your best smile, and uh, we'll get Jess in the traditional form. Jess, you have to be wahda bil tool, wahda bil ard. I think everyone knows why. Nem benyújtani, beszkobosztál, 
Daniel, nem benni a te nevez, kobosz ába, bezol, if not in ted, vevet, a grói, zsennói, thronos, nem mis, rompi, nem anszi, oly, nérénik. En te fevi oly, no gazsi, tíró, szabé, szít, no e csalav, gen, kolem. Tove vezreston szeri egon tev kanen novin anev Chenu ohiri nikatam evneshten Ay kiri elei son, kiri elei son Kiri eflogi son amin Esmo eroi, esmo eroi Estimet aniakon evon gain biesmo Christos ben noti Amin eseshovi Peace, grant us your peace, establish for us your peace, and forgive us our sins. For thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, and the might forever. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us together in peace. We ask you, Lord, to allow us to depart, but never allow us to depart from your presence. The intercessions of St. Mary, your pure mother, and St. Mina the Miraculous, and the blessings of the fast you fasted for our salvation, the blessings of all the fathers gathered, make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen.